Hello, welcome everybody. This is Sart from LSNTAP. Um, we have a training today coming up on translation memory and machine translation. Uh, but before we jump in, I'm gonna take a second, let a few more people log on and introduce you to our new website. Um, LSNTAP has just moved over to the DLAW template. Uh, we have uh, guides on call center technology and online triage that are being um, highlighted and all of our trainings are now under the events tab. Um, we've got about 12 more trainings coming up this year, including um, two on information security, one on disaster planning, one more on language access. So I definitely recommend checking those out. Um, also our YouTube channel has started to increase the number of videos we're putting on there. We're putting on some shorter videos that are focused on trying to take a five or 10 minute takeaway from some of our longer webinars. For example, uh, we have a full webinar up on web accessibility that LSC put on about a month ago. We put together 10 tips for web accessibility. That's about a quick five minute video uh, to pull out some of those things. So I definitely recommend checking out our YouTube channel. So we're going to talk about um, tools to create uh, language language um, target target language in content and it's all focused on written work we're not going to talk about oral interpretation and i'm very happy because we have an amazing panel um and we have and we're gonna focus first on the most well-known one which is machine translation and then we're going to go to translation memory so each of the speakers will introduce themselves what I wanted to do is, I don't know if, if you have seen this very helpful map from the self-represented litigant network. They have um, this map that is based on American survey data that looks and you can, this is just a print screen. If we were in the actual tool, you could zoom in and see what your counties look like. And um, you can see that the, the gradient because the highest one, the darkest one, is for 30, 38 to 94%. You can see that vastly populated areas of the country are having increasing language diversity. And then the, the lightest one is areas that only have less than 3% of people that speak a language other than English in their home. And you can see that those tend to be in areas where there's not large populations. So this is just a tool that I think it's really helpful to review and plan when you're making all sorts of decisions about uh, providing services and what materials to put out because you can dig out, dig, dig on this a little more. So um, just, you know, this, this, the diversity is basically increasing of the languages that people speak at, at home. And just um, as a reminder that the, the standard that everybody that's um, required to provide language assistance is required to meet is a meaningful access standard. And that's a, that's a pretty important concept because it means that the language has to be understood, the translated language has to be understood by the group reading it. And so if it is incorrect, or grammatically incorrect, the meaning could change and it won't be meaningful. So just that's kind of the, the standard there on either oral, written, or focus here is on written. And the other thing I wanted to share is that we're gonna focus on written. We generally, when we talk about language um, access, people talk about interpreters and translations as if they were the same skill. And we often go back and forth. And we generally say the translator did this or the translator said that. When you hear translation and oral said, spoken word, that's incorrect. The technical word um, translation denotes the written language. The technical word interpretation denotes oral. And they are not interchangeable skills. Somebody could be a fantastic oral interpreter, but they may not have the capacity or ability to translate. And same thing, though it's it's harder to translate than to speak, but um, there could be cases where somebody is a fantastic translator, but will not be comfortable just jumping cold into any conversation, particular one of legal nature. So just wanted to flag that the focus today is mostly on the written word, not the spoken word. And um, 
On machine translation, I think that this is one that is more well known and understood. I think it has captured our imagination and it's something that a lot of people use um, either on phone apps or through the Google Translate, probably the most common one. Just wanted to call out that there's a lot more. Um, there's all sorts of choices of tools with this. Um, and so we're going to focus on this one. Diana Glick, who's going to be our next presenter, will cover more on this from her perspective and experience. And then the second half of the presentation, we're going to look at translation memory. So I'm going to give presenter status to Diana. Hold on just a second. And we'll get into, into the nitty gritty with that. Just one minute. Okay. Okay, we see. Can you see my screen? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me go over here and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Okay, now, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So um, thank you, Claudia. It's um, really great to be here with everyone this morning talking about one of my favorite topics in the world, which is um, the intersection of law and language, which I like to say that's where I work, is at that intersection at the Judicial Council. I am an attorney here with the Center for Families, Children, and the Courts um, with the Judicial Council of California. I am a former professional translator, which is what I did before I went to law school. And I'm a former Spanish teacher. I'm also a current Spanish teacher. I teach legal Spanish at UC Davis School of Law in Davis, California. Um, with my legal work here at the Judicial Council, I really focus on um, lots of things related to self-represented litigants, um, but I also have a big focus on um, limited English proficient court users and language access issues. Um, and so that is why I like to say that I work at this intersection of language and law, and it's truly a joy because those are both great passions of mine, and there's, they have a lot of uh, relationship. Um, so I guess I'm here to talk about the bad news. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm first, but um, hopefully it won't all be bad news. Uh, but the title of my presentation is The Perils of Google Translate, so it's not exactly all good news either. Um, because of the role that I have here at the Judicial Council of having um, formerly been a translator and having the Spanish knowledge, I do um, review all of our Spanish assets um, for both linguistic and legal accuracy. Um, and because of that, I often get requests like the one that you see in this email here. And I call this the dreaded email. Um, this happens, I don't want to say frequently, but it does happen. Um, and you can see here that this person is asking me to review a translation that she has already put through Google Translate. So what they needed um, for this particular situation was they were doing a pilot program. And they needed a few signs. Um, obviously, here you can see they were just going to do some paper signs. It's just a pilot program, so they weren't going to invest in a lot of signage at this point, but they needed a few paper signs. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, this is kind of a frustrating situation to be in as a professional. Um, but I will say that having experienced this several times throughout my career, I would say that it's given me a lot of perspective on the way that Google Translate works and doesn't work. Um, and also it's taught me a lot about what has to be done with source text. So when you are going to translate something, most of the work actually happens before you even hand it over to the translator. Um, so that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. So um, as I said, uh, this person just needed a quick sign. I just need a quick sign. Um, they weren't going to invest a lot of money, just going to be on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. And so the first sign that they wanted translated was this way to finds room. So you can see that Google didn't do so well with that translation. Even if you don't have a lot of experience with Spanish, you can probably tell that the Spanish is not great on this one. Esta habitación de way to find. That's not really going to work. So why didn't this work? Um, well, first of all, we have a couple of problems here. First of all, um, which way, right? When, when you say this way, what are, what are we talking about exactly? Um, and also finds room. You, you can't imagine how much time I spent researching this issue of what courts call this place a finds room. And this place is really where someone goes to, usually to pay a traffic ticket. Um, 
And so it turns out that there are a handful of, of courts that call it the fines room. Most people call it other things like payment desk or cashier or um, fines desk maybe. But the fines room, that was a new one for me. So I spent a lot of time researching that um, to make sure that we were giving them a proper translation. Um, so, you know, what did I learn from this experience? Well, when you want to put together a sign, really the key here is to use some visuals. And our friends at Transcend, who we're going to hear from in a minute, have developed a great set of legal icons that they share freely with the world, and it's just a wonderful contribution to our work. Um, they are the ones who developed the, the little um, people that you see there with the dollar sign. Um, and also getting rid of the language of this way and just putting an arrow simplifies things a lot. Um, and then I also played around a little bit with the fines room concept, and I always find that this is um, it can be a little bit tricky, right? Because if you have a bronze plaque that says fines room over your fines room, um, maybe you need to stick with that <laughs> and not try to change it. Um, even though something like payment of fines or, you know, fines, just fines alone might be a better way to go. So what are some of those best practices um, when we're talking about signage specifically? First of all, check for existing resources, right? Because there is just no need to reinvent the wheel on multilingual signage at this point. A lot of places have developed signs in different languages, and in particular here in California, we have a glossary of signage terms and icons. It is the second to the last um, link on this page, and that is located in our language access toolkit, and it contains 73 of the most common terms that you will see in courthouse settings, um, so wayfinding and um, directional signage and things like that, um, and the basic components of a courthouse, the jury room, the, uh, the clerk's office, things like that. So we have a lot of those things already translated, and they've been put into plain language and translated into 10 languages. So, so much of this work has already been done. So anytime someone comes to me with a signage issue, I like to point them in this direction first. Um, there's just no need to reinvent the wheel on signage. So here's another example. I just need a quick sentence. I'll hear. Um, and this quick sentence says, unlawful detainer cases will be heard in room four. Seems simple enough, but you can see what happened here in Spanish. Um, that became los casos de detención ilegal se escucharán en la sala cuatro. So one way that you can check if you don't speak the language that you're translating into, and I only speak one of them, so um, I have to employ this often, is to back translate things to see what you're getting, right? Um, and when we back translate this, we see that Google is translating this as cases of illegal detention. So those of us who work with the term unlawful detainer day in and day out, this probably just blows right by us. Um, and I don't even know whether that's a common term in other states. But in California, that is an eviction notice, um, you know, a, a complaint for unlawful detainer leads to an eviction um, or can but it certainly has nothing to do with illegal detention. So you can see here where things really went awry with Google. Um, and why is that the case? Well, okay, first of all, we have a legal term of art in unlawful detainer. Um, this seemingly simple sentence is actually loaded with legal terms of art and some confusing constructions. Um, and first of all, unlawful detainer kind of shows off you know, some of the etymological background of our legal terms that we use. Um, some of them come from Old English. Some of them actually derive from Latin, in this case from French, and ultimately from Latin. Um, so, you know, very word nerd stuff here <laughs> going on. Um, but not so easy to translate. It is a, a term of art. Um, even the term hearing is actually a little bit of a term of art. Um, not all languages connect court processes with the term hearing, um, which has other connotations in English as well. Um, also, the construction of will be heard is a little bit confusing, right? I don't know if this is a sign or if this is on a piece of paper, but um, it could be a whole lot clearer. And so why is this so difficult? Well, in English, context is everything, all right? So here is my cute little mouse in this beautiful field. And my instructions are use the mouse to navigate through the form fields and enter the information in each one. Um, in English, we tend to use the same words to convey m different concepts. Um, sometimes many different concepts can be packed into a single term. And how do we figure out what we're talking about? Well, it's all about context. So um, 
you know, court is another example of this. The word court can have many different meanings in English. And if you were to translate that in isolation, you really wouldn't know what you were talking about. So looking at um, an example that's not Spanish for once, um, simplified Chinese, and I did have this checked with a Chinese speaker colleague of mine here. Um, you can see that in Chinese, they're not so much like the English in that respect, right? They have different words for different things. Um, so here you have mouse and the term for mouse in Chinese. And what's interesting is that it appears, my understanding from this talking to my colleague here is that this uh, term in Chinese is computer mouse. Right, which which makes sense. So they added a little bit to it to give it that context and to be able to understand what we're talking about. Um, but for field, you really are talking about two very different words. You have the field of wheat, and then you have a form field. Completely different terms in Chinese. So the benefit that you get from having a human translator as opposed to a Google translator a Google Translate program is that that person can understand or ask, you know, what kind of document is this? What is the larger message of this document? How will the document be used? Who is the intended user of this document? Who's going to be the reader? Um, when you send a document to a human translator, they're able to consider and understand all these factors or ask questions and really get a sense of the overall project. So therefore, my best practices on this one in terms of legal concepts, and um, how to convey all of those would be to absolutely, uh, we recommend a professional translator um, whenever you can. Um, and we also recommend an additional, an additional legal review step to be performed by a bilingual attorney. Um, so this is important as well because sometimes something can be beautifully translated but not make sense within, um, this is what I've seen um, at the Judicial Council, that something can be beautifully translated but not necessarily um, be coherent with the way that we translate concepts at the Judicial Council and the way that the judiciary has chosen to translate and convey certain concepts. So that legal review step is really critical to making sure that you have a, a readable, uh, well-translated, and legally accurate document. So here is a request I have not received by email. I don't want to <laughs> misconstrue that. Um, but I just need a quick consent to an otherwise illegal search. Um, I didn't get an email about this one, but I was asked to share a little bit about this case. It's a recent federal case. Um, it's USD Omar Cruz Zamora. I'm happy to send the citation to anyone who wants to read it. It's out of the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas. Um, and I'll just kind of give you an overall uh, view of the facts of the case. So uh, this occurred on September 21st of 2017, 3 in the morning. Officer Ryan Wolting of the Kansas Highway Patrol stopped Mr. Omar Cruz Zamora on I-70. Mr. Cruz Zamora was driving with a suspended registration. Um, because he spoke Spanish and didn't speak or understand English very well, the officer began to use Google Translate on his in-car laptop to communicate with um, Mr. Cruz Zamora. So at some point in the conversation, Officer Wolting typed into Google Translate the following question, can I search the car? Here is what was shown to Mr. Cruz Zamora as the Spanish translation of the question. You can see it's right here, puedo buscar el auto. After some back and forth indicating a lack of understanding, Mr. Cruz Zamora said, sure, okay, yeah. That's a direct quote from the case. The car was searched and drugs were uncovered during the search. Apparently quite a bit of drugs. So Cruz Zamora filed a motion to suppress the evidence uncovered during the search on the grounds that his consent was not freely given with full understanding because of the language barrier and the use of Google Translate, which generated an unclear translation. Without his consent, the search was illegal. This was his argument. So you can see here how it was translated. Um, let's back translate this one because I find it fascinating. First of all, um, those of you who speak Spanish will spot the problem right away with searching being translated as buscar, okay? Um, buscar means to look for something, not to look through something. So if I'm going to help you look for your contact that fell out of your eye, you would use buscar. Okay. But if you were going to be looking through something, you would have different words which are suggested over here, such as registrar, inspeccionar, some other terms in Spanish. Um, but what kills me about this whole thing is that when you back translate, it gets even worse because it says, can I find the car? Which is, I mean, that's completely wrong. So, yeah, I don't know what... Google was thinking on that one. Um, so what did the court say about all this? Um, they called in experts. They called in translators. 
And um, their decision was that they found it was not reasonable for the officer to rely on Google Translate for the purpose of seeking consent to search this man's car. Uh, they suppressed the evidence of the drugs found during the search. Um, specifically, they found that consent was not obtained. The translation was not precise. The good faith exception did not apply in this case because apparently the officer had an ability to call into a dispatcher for language assistance. Um, because it's Spanish, I think they had somebody sort of at the ready for him, and he opted, instead of you know, using that resource, he decided to pull up Google Translate and use Google Translate instead. So ultimately, the situation here is that those drugs were suppressed, and um, he got his motion to suppress granted. So just some concluding thoughts. You know, is it ever okay to use Google Translate? Um, I certainly have used it. Um, I, as a soccer mom, have to communicate with people who speak many different languages sometimes, let them know where the pizza party is, when picture day is. Um, I use it for informal communications where we're not talking about life or death or drugs on the highway. Um, for general understanding, it can be very helpful. Um, when you are in a complete bind, I think that would be potentially a situation that might justify using Google Translate. Um, I can't speak to any of the other tools out there. I've only had this experience um, really working with Google Translate and testing it for our own purposes. Um, but I will say that you know, the court in their decision in the Cruz Zamora case did sort of leave an out um, because of the fact that he had this access to um, an interpreter. Uh, he could have called into his dispatcher and gotten access to someone. Um, if he had not had that ability, or perhaps if Mr. Cruz Zamora spoke a language that he was not able to figure out, or potentially um, a language that's very rare and they didn't have an interpreter available to speak to him, uh, maybe that would have flown. I don't know. Um, but on the legal side, I think that's kind of where it stands. So the major takeaways that I just wanted to share with everyone today is that um, there are, first of all, there's a lot of resources out there. If you need to translate something, it just, it always pays to look to see what's out there first. And most people are really happy to share their resources with you, um, including California. So uh, please do that. And then if you find that you absolutely do need to create something completely from scratch, there's a lot that you can do and really should do to facilitate translation, um, including plain language review, simplifying your structures, using visuals, all those things, depending on what your translation is. And at the end of the day, it's really hard to go wrong with a professional translation. Um, and then a best practice on top of that would be to have a legal review of the translation. So that's it for me. I don't know, are we taking questions here or at the end, Claudia? Um, we can definitely take questions here if we have them. We uh, All the questions that we have currently are uh, tech-oriented, uh, okay. trying to help people out with stuff. So we don't have any subject okay. matter specific yet. OK. Great. So Claudia, should I? Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, um, our next presenter is going to be Leland Sampson. And Leland, I see that you have your mic ready to go. And we are, do you want to be the presenter or do you want me to run the slides for you? Um, it's probably easier for me if you run the okay. slides, Claudia. Okay. okay. I just so have a couple I, here. Yeah, so let me just do that. I'll grab it then. Okay. And just uh, prompt me to change it. I already sent a okay. request to Leland to be a presenter. All right, let me see if that uh, works. I, I selected, um, said OK. I'm not sure if you can, oh. Um, I have them here if you want me to run them. I, it says that Leland's presenter. Um, did you go to full okay. screen mode, Leland? Uh, now I I'm think seeing I got the audio it. screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that works. Okay. okay. So, hello, everyone. My name is Leland Sampson. I am an attorney at the Maryland State Law Library, and I run a web uh, legal self-help website called the People's Law Library. And, Claudia, you can go to the next uh, 
So the People's Law Library is a legal self-help website, the objective of which is to help people do legal research about issues that they might encounter in Maryland state courts. And so the objective is to provide plain language and inf legal information um, to help folks do legal research and solve problems. And we can go to the next slide. So what are some of the things that we provide? We provide instructional articles, topical articles, and a couple of other services. So in terms of instructional articles, they're procedural type articles that describe how to do something. So if someone needs to file a motion or file a case or file an appeal, um, we have instructional articles on how to do, the, do that. Um, we have about 350 articles on substantive law that are sort of uh, encyclopedia type articles. Some are as short as 500 words, some are as long as a few thousand words. Um, we're in the process of taking those few those few articles that are in the thousands and, and breaking them down into much more manageable chunks. Um, we also have a legal services directory that has over 100 different organizations in Maryland that provide self-help resources for folks. So if individuals are looking for uh, pro bono or reduced cost legal assistance, then they can find the appropriate organization in our directory. We also have a clinic calendar that has a calendar of free legal clinics around the state. We also help connect people with people. So we have a, the Maryland Court Judiciary offers a self-help center where folks can chat with an attorney for free. Um, we have a link to the chat with a lawyer on all of our pages, as well as Ask a Law Librarian. So folks can submit questions directly to the Maryland State Law Library reference desk and have their questions answered directly from there. And we can go to the next slide. So what you're really here to, in, and interested in discussing is the way we use translation memory um, and how we translate articles. So our workflow generally is this. So uh, someone, a volunteer contacts me and I verify their credentials, um, make sure that they have uh, pro, a proficiency in the foreign language as well as um, some legal credentials. They either select a, an article or I assign them an article to translate. That article is then uploaded to the translation management system that we use called Lingotech. And the article or Lingotech interfaces directly with the People's Law Library content management system so that the um, article goes directly from our CMS up to Lingotech. Lingotech does its analysis of the article, splits it up into segments, and then allows the volunteer to actually get in and translate. Once the translation is completed, then the article is assigned to a reviewer who is a licensed attorney who has uh, the foreign language expertise as well. Um, following that review, then the translation is re-imported into our content management system and it's published from there. And we can go to the next slide. So we have about, the, the languages that we support are Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and French. We have uh, over 150 articles currently translated in Spanish. Um, we have our 100 most popular articles translated, and that represents about 75% of all of our site traffic. So the, the breadth of coverage of the articles that we do have translated is, is pretty broad. And we can go to the next slide from here. This is what Lingotech looks like from the volunteer perspective when they are doing the translation. So the art on the left hand side there is where the original text uh, appears as a segment and the volunteer types in their information uh, or types in their translation from there. On the bottom, it will fill in the Spanish or the whatever the target translation is um, as the volunteer is going so they can have context and then um, on the next slide, we'll demonstrate the translation memory. Um, so, Claudia, if you could go. Uh, the, this is the translation memory. So, for individuals who are not familiar with it, um, I'll try and give a, a brief description of it, and I'm sure one of our later presenters can uh, correct me if I get anything wrong here. Um, the translation memory takes previous translations that have been done and does an analysis of the um, Thing that is trying to be translated now so it tries to do matching so if a word or a phrase or a sentence has previously been translated then it will provide 
um, that information to the translator so that the translator can do a translation that is consistent with what's come before. So Claudia, I think that finishes my presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. I have some benefits and some drawbacks of the translation memory system that we've used thus far. So we find that it's, it's helpful for encouraging volunteers. Um, people get really excited when they're able to use a really cool, nifty uh, online tool. It's useful because it doesn't involve uh, emailing documents back and forth and things getting messed up with formatting and losing links and things like that. So it's, it's very easy from on the volunteers to very quickly get started and reduces their management burden and their overhead. The, our, the system that we use also provides um, a custom glossary support. So we were able to upload the glossary that we had previously used for translation um, for consistency purposes. And the automatic segmentation is nice because it breaks up the article into manageable chunks. So now we can discuss some of the drawbacks that we've encountered with the system. Um, the primary uh, drawback that we've seen, um, Claudia, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Yep, there you go. Um, it can be expensive um, in certain cases. Um, and the quality of the translation sort of varies based on the interpreters that you're using. Um, and in our particular case, our translators are not court certified interpreters. So very often um, the reviewer burden is sometimes high depending on who is doing the initial translation because the uh, translation may be more or less accurate um, depending on who's doing the volunteering. So that's kind of just a, a quick overview of what the Pupils Law Library volunteer translation uh, project looks like at this time. Thank you, Leland. We'll uh, stop to see if there's any questions on um, translation memory systems. For Leland, um, how do you screen volunteer translators for language ability um, in the source and target languages? So they usually, we almost always have volunteers who have uh, educational background in Spanish. Um, mo I, most of our volunteers who are not already attorneys who have, who are bilingual in practice um, in that context, um, there are students who are involved in uh, Spanish on in legal classes where they're using Spanish um, in either a clinic setting um, or in the school setting. So that's kind of the way that we do the vetting. Um, if they're an attorney and they hold themselves out as being proficient in a foreign language, then we rely on their ethical obligation to provide accurate information. Any other questions? Everybody clear on how the segmentation works and how this is different than what? Um, I think Maria will be able, probably be able to provide a, a better um, description of what translation memory is, um, since that's kind of her mm -hmm. her bailiwick there. Okay. Well, let me pause the screen then. Any other questions? No. Okay, so I'm going to pause and now we're going to switch over to Maria Medlin and Nicole Newman, who are both with Transcend, and they're going to cover a little bit more on translation memory systems and share from their experience other ways um, to improve the quality that comes out of these tools. So you are now presenters. Do you want me to run it for you? I think we can do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Maria Mindlin and I'm here with Nicole. And, um, and we're at Transcend, and Transcend is a language uh, service provider. We do certified translation in uh, the U.S. minority languages, and we also do plain language. 
And uh, Nicole is, uh, has many hats here at Transcend, but her biggest hat is she's a software uh, specialist and uh, she handles all of our uh, translation uh, memory, uh, well, all, all of our software issues. And that includes the translation memory programs that we use and how translation memory integrates with our other um, software programs and how um, that impacts languages that use different font systems and have different um, needs um, than just the standard Roman alphabet languages. And um, part of my job here at Transcend is I work in, um, when I work in other languages, I use uh, translation memory um, in the editing environment. And I also use uh, mach machine translation mostly for corpora searches to find frequencies of phrasings to determine what's the best choice for different ways of saying things. So these are tools that we use here every day um, at Transcend and um, we'll uh, show you a bit about how we use them on the next slides. Um, uh, thank you. Um, just really briefly, one of our slides, I'm sorry that um, didn't have enough time to get in there is our process. And we want to tell you that the way that we do translations is um, a bit laborious. <laughs> and, um, and we use um, uh, professional certified translators. Um, and then we have them reviewed by professional certified editors. And then we have what we call microproofing, so a proofer who goes sentence by sentence to make sure that everything's complete. Then we have macroproofing, so someone who checks in on, well, they're the same number of elements in the table of contents, that all the address and phone numbers are correct, that the key information uh, corresponds, and looking more at the global issues. And then we have what Diana was talking about. We have a um, our clients uh, have a subject uh, matter expert, uh, a lawyer from the Judicial Council who would review our work to make sure that it's legally sufficient and accurate and um, uh, we make any adjustments that, that often it leads to a conversation about, well, let's research this a little more or we'll change this or what do you think about that? but we make adjustments as needed. Uh, we note any adjustments in glossaries so we can make sure that we're tracking our clients' preferences. Um, you know, what uh, the Judicial Council in California may like may be a bit different than what uh, Tennessee may like. So we would track the preferences uh, by client. And then as we've seen field testing is really becoming a reality, and that's the ultimate test, to make sure that the consumers can read and understand it. Um, because if that's not happening, then there really wasn't much point in spending all that time and money in doing that translation. And so that may lead to further adjustments in the language, and in turn, that would lead to adjustments in our glossary and make us uh, make some changes on how we're saying things. So that's our process. So and a quick question uh, here is, um, what is a certified translator and who does those kind of certifications? Okay, so maybe we could take that. I'd be happy to take that. First of all, there's some information on our website on certification that talks about this, all the certifying agencies uh, in the United States. That might be one quick way of uh, answering that. And uh, if that's okay, um, we could go through the translation memory um, stuff and come back to that. Does that sound okay? okay? If, if you can All get right. us a link to that, I can get that out to the panel. Also. Sure. So it's transcend.net library. And then look, look for a translator certification. And uh, so on the next slide, um, this is the type of environment that as an editor that I would work in. This is called a two-column uh, two export file. And if you look at the colored areas of the files, the translation memory file will tell you how often the 
the particular tool, there's many translation memory tools, um, but how often your memory tool has seen this particular segment before. So everywhere it's yellow, it's new. So this is typical. If you're doing a new document, new topic, it will have seen it 0% times before. Um, the ones where it's seen it 100% uh, times before, it's like top, right? You're doing a website, it's seen, you seen top, of course, many times before. So it will naturally fill that in. Uh, if you're doing, if it's the URL for the particular website, it will have seen that many times before. So when it's seen it before, it will offer you the same translation that it's seen previously. When it's seen it 96% times before, it could be that maybe something is italicized and that's the change that you have to make, or there's one word that's different and that's the change that you have to make. So these percentages um, tag uh, how often you've seen it before and this uh, export file um, has all the tags in it um, that also uh, key the uh, text enhancements. And so this is one type of file that um, the TM can generate for you to edit in. There's also the more typical type of file, which uh, most of the translators prefer, and that's on the next slide. And this is similar to what Leland was showing us that his translators uh, work in, where it goes segment by segment. And you can see where it says 100% that's seen it before. And so it's seen this piece of text, this segment, 100% before. And it's going to offer you what the last translator put in and confirmed as the right text before. And then if you are the next volunteer translator and you accept that, then you just click on it and then go to the next piece. And if it hasn't seen that before, then it's up to you to translate. If you go to the next piece down and it's seen it 100% before, you can accept it. So you just go through piece by piece and then it will reconstruct it and put it together um, for you in the original format. And uh, the Last way uh, in which um, you can edit the text is with your invisibles on. on. <laughs> so this would be like in a Microsoft Word document where you click on your paragraph symbol to turn your invisibles on. And you, you just have to be super careful not to do anything to those little tags in there because then you completely mess up the system and then you be sorry you did and it's a big pain. But if you keep, make sure you keep your cursor out of those little tiny red numbers with the less than, more than signs, um, then you can see the source text and the target text at the same time. The source text, if you turned off your invisibles, you wouldn't be able to see it. You'd only be able to see the Spanish. But this is like super helpful for the editors because um, you can look at the English and Spanish segment by segment at the same time, which really speeds you up. And then you can, as an editor, I can make my changes and track changes in what uh, uh, for a TM you call an unclean file. And then the um, translator or we can incorporate those changes to memory so that we have what we think is the cleanest, most correct version of the translation or let's say that we want um, like our subject matter reviewer to um, incorporate her, ch her changes too. We could also, I could put in my changes and then I could send a file like this to the subject matter reviewer after I incorporated my changes and have her do the same. So we could incorporate another, another level of changes so that we could, in, you know, we could really get in a lot of level of changes to this file so that um, we're really spiffing up our memory and incorporating another level of review to it as well. So here we're using memory and we're also using um, the track change tools uh, in Microsoft to be able to improve the translation and to incorporate um, those corrections 
uh, into the final TM. And to write notes to each other. So we use the comment function as well. So it could be, for instance, that in the comment function, it, it, I, we could be writing notes to each other about this is a change I made, I'm not really sure, um, but I suggest it for this reason. Or uh, a note to the client, there seems to be a mistake in your English here, or you know something like that. So it's a really nice way of getting all of your dialogue and your corrections or commentary in the same place. And uh, this one, I'll go over a little bit, but uh, Nicole, sitting to my right, is the woman who's really our technology expert here, too, but for the, um, the translation tools. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, some misunderstanding about who the TM is for and who's using it. And definitely the TM, like who should be using it, these are, these. These are tools for the professional translator. Why, why should they use it? And they should use it because it helps them to be faster if they have documents with repeated text. If you're not working with re high volume of repeated text, and that means like 75% and above repetitions, it's really not useful to you. If you do have 75% and above, it is useful to you. And then, of course, you have to be able to know how to manage the intricacies of the software. And if you're just not that kind of techie person that can do that, then it's not for you. <laughs> and then you have to be working with clients um, that have that sort of need. So, for instance, if you have a client that has every document is really like a new surprise, which many clients are like that, it doesn't, TM is not useful for you. But if you have clients that really have a lot of similarities across their documents, then it really helps you be faster and it helps you be more efficient. Um, if you have clients that have uh, like an average for clients, we find that uh, clients um, in the legal sector tend to have somewhere between like 10 and 12 percent repeated text across their documents. So if you have 10 percent repeated text, you will see some savings. Um, and that's good. Why not get 10 percent savings? It's especially good for form producers. You can imagine that there's form producers that have so much repeated text. And so those like those little pieces we saw on the German forms, you can just pick them up and immediately populate them for you in different areas and also reproduce the formatting, which is a huge time savings. So that's where it really is of big uh, value. And uh, also the term base can be a great uh, tool in terms of keeping glossaries standard. And this is when it really matters, I think, to have uh, professional and certified translators to make sure you're using terms that are going to be legally hold up to scrutiny and also that are going to be consistent and standard with what other states and legal service agencies are using. And then hopefully as field testing comes more and more into play um, with what people understand so that when we get to writing articles, we're using the same, like for expungement, we're using the same words that are being used in other states. And uh, we're using words that the readers are gonna understand. So it's not a different word in every state, and it's not a word that the readers aren't familiar with. And uh, the TM software that most translators use are we just call it Trados and Deja Vu, MemoQ, WordPass Pro. And um, Nicole, you may know, but I, I don't know people that use the free tools. Do um, I don't know anybody that we work with that uses those tools. Uh, the nice thing about uh, translation memory software, uh, it doesn't matter which one they're using, the files are interchangeable. 
So once, once, if somebody's using WordFast Pro, they can export the file in a format that you can load into, let's say you're using Trados. So there is a big benefit um, to using uh, software that uh, you do have to pay for up front, and it's an initial investment. But the, we, we, because we're a trans, translation company, we own Trados, but our translators use whatever they want to use. And it's on them to um, have that software, update the software. So it's not an expenditure on our part. Any certified professional translator will use their own translation memory, um, so, uh, cap tools like software. So it, and then once we get, when, when they send us the file, then we load it into our translation memory and we can keep the um, glossary and term bases updated and all of our segments of translation updated here in the office as well. Um, but most, most professional, uh, certified translators will not use free translation memory software. And it's not a huge investment uh, to buy it, but it's if you're going to be using it a lot, it's worth it definitely to use something that's not free. I think is that it for us? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Do we have questions on the chat? No, just the one over the certified translators, and we dropped a link into the questions for Transcend's uh, resources there. Okay. Well, I I do have um, a question, and I want to thank both Maria, Nicole, and Lilan for showing, sharing a little bit more background and, and screens on the translation memory, because it's a tool that's been out for a little while, but not one that we have really... Uh, utilize. I think that Leland's program is a pioneer um, in doing that. Um, in, I, 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 I saw that you said that it's really good for high volume, you know, high volume or people that are using like formulaic, formulaic language. Do you know if courts are using this for their forms? Would forms be a good candidate? For uh, for use with translation memory. So it's really a, it's really a translator tool rather than um, more of a like a company uh, sort of tool. And for you know court forms tend to be. It, it, I'm speaking of the the forms that we are familiar with tend to be different enough that there's not a high volume of repetition of the text, but it's still helpful to use, use it because at least you're getting consistency every time you, know, you see um, you know, defendant, plaintiff, party, uh, hearing date, that sort of thing. So even if you're not getting um, savings related to efficiencies, you are getting uh, uh, consistency. Now the important thing is what kind of consistency are you getting, right? So you want to make sure that people that are using your translation memory are certified professionals and are putting the right terms in it. Because what if, you know, they're, you're starting off with, um, well, put it, that, that's I guess what I wanted to say. <laughs> you want the right terms. <laughs> Your translation memory is only as good as what's put into it. So you have to really make sure that as you build your database and your terms, that it's of a certain quality and of a certain level. Because you're only going to get a translation back out that is, is I mean, and it, this is basically how Google Translate and machine translation works as well. There's really a lot of similarity in that. Um, Google Translate is only as good as the humans that put uh, translation into it. And uh, it spits it out using algorithms, whereas translation memory tools, CAT tools, is actually produced and controlled 
by the uh, certified translator. So the quality level, if it's good quality being put into your translation memory, you're going to get a very high quality level out. So it's taking it to a next level then like, you know, we, we there was a project in Illinois uh, probably five years, six years ago where they hire somebody that had been trained as an attorney in Mexico City and who was also a certified core translator here in Illinois. So he was like triple qualified and he, he basically, uh, the project was to compare the quality of um, doing the machine translation, the other tool that Diana was talking about, and then doing his own translations. And the conclusion that came out of that TIG project, what I think the community took out was the, the notion that if you're going to use um, the statistical translation, the machine translation, that it will always, um, the best practice is then to have a certified translator to review it. So this translation memory kind of takes that to a more industrial level, right? In the sense that, and and the tool itself is already built for review and comment like you share. So it's no. a way to doing it more from an enterprise perspective, as no. opposed to just doing it. No? no, no, this is not, it doesn't, this doesn't assume that you start with machine translation. This assumes that you start with a human and that you speed up the human's uh, workflow by recognizing texts that the humans who have worked on this project before have recognizes things that you've translated before. So it it there's it, no it, machine it, translation. You just feed it the you just feed it the direct content, and then mm -hmm. a, a certified uh, interpreter reviews it basically. No, but you you no. give it what you're going to translate. You give it the language, and you say that what what have we done before, and they will give you the matches. Right, that's right. It looks at the database and segment by segment, and if you've translated it before, either on the current document or in the previous database, and if you're working on a larger project that other translators have contributed to in that memory, then it will um, use the translations from the memory and offer it to you. Is it, is it easy to share those memories like nationally? If we've got a bunch of forms being done in Minnesota and we've got a bunch of forms being done in Washington, um, can you share those memories? It, does each um, instance have its own and we're acting in silos? Well, it's a very, it's, it's a complicated question. And, okay. um, and one of the things, it has to do with quality control. When you share memory, it necessarily means that people are adding to the memory. And um, that's something that we handle very um, uh, cautiously at Transcend because we, uh, for instance, there's, we, there's, uh, we don't use other people's memory, <laughs> if I can answer it that way. And so um, it's possible I mean, that it's possible, you could add things to the memory yeah. that would reduce the quality of the memory and then and then you essentially be turning it into MT rather than TM. And then there'd be no point in having TM. Does that make sense? I, I see what you're saying, yes. So, okay. I don't, if there are other questions, I, let's see if there, but I do have a follow up question for Nicole. Yes. Any questions, Sart, from the audience? So have you considered have using something like um, TensorFlow to enable machine learning to use translations provided by translators to offer users some automatic translation? So instead of taking um, general using kind of a curated data set? Um, 
Uh, this was from uh, David Rodriguez. Is the question for Leland? Um, it did not say who the question was for. It was just submitted into the question oh, box. I think yeah. I think that he's asking about uh, some data analytics AI tool, TensorFlow. I don't remember. Maybe we can unmute David so he can explain what that is because that's um that's a different sort of tool in a, in a more advanced AI in quotations. I don't remember who makes yeah. it. I don't remember if it's Microsoft so, or Google. We're, we're, I've just unmuted we're specializing David. in certified legal translations. So you know, when we when we use TM, what it means is that we're relying on this very clean database of translation that's been produced by certified translators, checked by certified editors, microed, macroed, gone through subject matter experts, and sometimes field tested. So we don't want to introduce text that is below those standards. So you know, we're in a very difficult um, you know, a much uh, more specialized area than m many other fields. So, so um, the, okay. I, I I'm not sure maybe for... that's what the vendors are doing. You know what I mean? Like there's the vendors have the revenue flow to create and maintain cutting edge technology. So probably the the programs that they share, they some of them may be using that. I don't think that at the legal aid level, anybody's working necessarily um, on machine learning for language. That's a huge, that's like the holy grail to get to the um, simultaneous interpreter in, that we had in Star Trek and the and the perfect translator without human intervention. That's like. We need quantum computing. You know what I mean? That's like a huge, so, huge problem. So, so that's I mean, an interesting one that you bring up there, Claudia. Answer. And that's I see right? that you dropped the article um, to the presenters. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share that with everybody, which is a June through 2010 article. Um, what has been the changes in technology in the last um, eight years since this article that I'm about to share with everyone? Um, and what has been the objective quality assessment changes since then? From from what I understand, the algorithms are getting a lot better and faster, right? And the processing and all of that is a lot faster. But it's the the problem is the computing model. It's not a question of algorithms. Is is what my cognitive, um, you know, the people that 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 do cog uh, cognitive computational linguistics at the national labs. What they tell me that the problem is that we're still using like silic, you know, carbon-based and silicon-based computing and that we really need is um, a supercomputer that can actually use quantum computing. And um, some groups are making breakthroughs on that. And so they say once we get to something that is so much more advanced and fast, then we may be able to break the problem. But um, so the advancements are all in the algorithms and the, the big data analytics, like the stuff that David was asking about, but not but not on the computing model. But you know, things are advancing. I mean, it, it may be five years, who knows, right? There's a lot of um, money to be made because this impacts um, the nice, um, commercial world, right? Like you see all the advertisements for trucks and um, big, big time um, commerce in Latin America, right? Amazon is very interested in, 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 in doing e-commerce in Latin America, Facebook too, Google. So they are, this is a race. This is a, this is a problem that has significant uh, billions of dollars in revenue. So it may be solved, but it's not going to be you know, it's it's a it's a billion it's a billion dollar problem. Do you have so, a question for Maria? Um, that just came in. Um, just going back to the um, TMs and whether they're stored in a cloud. Oh yes. Um, so, so it can be. It depends on what you're you know how you're set up. 
Um, some companies have it where they have um, their cat tools, where there's a basically a the database bank. It's it's a, more of a it's set up as a server. Um, that's like, but that's that is very expensive, and you have to have mass quantities of uh, translation, and it wouldn't be for like a small like just somebody using it like as as a translator. So that would be more for the company to set up to use this as a server. Um, what we find more often is that it's it's a by a translate per translator basis. So the answer is yes and no <laughs> to that one. So if if a program has someone coming to them um, offering to do translations, um, what are the kind of first three steps? that that program should take in kind of making sure that they know what they're doing and then helping them uh, get up with, get set up with software and tools to do it effectively. Well, it's not so much that the program uh, needs the translation tools, although it should um, retain access to the memory because if they change vendors, they'll want to maintain the memory so that they can apply it to future vendors. So having the, having the memory files um, will be something that they, they'll want to say that they'll want to keep. Because let's say you, you know, work with us for a year and then <clears throat> for whatever reason you don't want to work with us anymore. You'll want to keep that memory because you want your language to be consistent with your next vendor. So that would be an important point. Um, to negotiate. So some of our clients require that we submit um, translation memory files uh, on, let's say, a quarterly basis. And so they, they hold on to the translation memory so that it, you know, as Maria said, sometimes if they go to another one of their vendors and they want to use that translation memory, then they have it to send to their other translator. It's more of a translator's tool than it is a client tool. Um, and you can keep and, man you, and manage it um, as the client, uh, but what we find more often is that they, we just export it um, as, and then we send it to them and, and it's all agreed upon that, you know, if they may have certain protocol that we have to follow within our translation memories, like tags and stuff and information for, for those segments. And it's really kind of up to the client to determine that what kind of information they want in their translation memories and, and then for us to provide it to them. Um, but that's all negotiated with, with the client. And I think as a client too, you want to say, um, you know, do do you, are you using translation memory? Is your team using translation memory? And um, if, if you genuinely have text that's so varied that it's not suitable to a translation memory discount, then, you know, then it will be hard to give you a translation memory discount, but, um, you're, but the software will be able to calculate, you know, what sort of repetitions you're getting. So if the, the, service is using translation memory, then you can ask for a translation memory discount. So we've got two more questions here, uh, or one's a comment, um, which is I believe uh, Trados um, allows you to use setup um, translations on a shared directory to share with multiple translators. That was from um, James Borg. Um, and then we've got uh, a question that comes up often, which is some websites include Google Translate buttons for legal aid organizations that use their website to provide provincial clients information about the types of services they offer and can what are the pros and cons of the Google Translate button specifically on a website? So I think Diana's presentation really responded to the perils of using Google Translate. And one of the things that I like to tell people is I have a son who works at Google and 
Um, so as you were mentioning, I mean, Google Translate is so much better than it used to be. And with the new neural networks and the advanced algorithms, it's a lot better. I mean, we can really see its improvements. But Google does not use Google Translate to translate their own websites. You know, we're a vendor to Google as a translator. So Google uses human translators to translate their own websites. So it's definitely suitable for so many things and it plays such an important role. But Google translating legal websites is not an appropriate use of Google Translate technology in our opinion. And um, that would be a mismatch. So only cons, no pros. Well, Diana covered a little bit of that. Right. I, I think that the, um, I think using Google Translate by itself, definitely terrible. The button does give people notice that there could be some mistakes, which is better than not notice, but it is still rough and needs a lot of work. As it improves over time, should definitely be evaluated. But that's that's where I am on it. That the, the notice helps a little bit, but honestly, if you have critical things like where to pay fines or your legal rights, you should be getting high quality translations. Well, the problem with the button is that it's a crutch, right? Because the button denotes that it's not something that they're doing just because they're on a pinch for two days. It is a crutch that could become long term. So the better approach would be to budget and put in your website roadmap and budget when you're going to get your content up in your target languages based on the demographics of the community that you serve. And if that takes, you know, hopefully when you when you start the website, you you are planning on that, and so it won't be a, a huge delay. I don't know um, in other communities disclaimers and you know legal depending on where people are coming from. Um, those disclaimers won't be appropriate. And what you may end up, they may not even understand the concept of a disclaimer. So the, um, what may end up happening is that when that community looks at your, at your web page and you have the Google Translate there, the translation could be so poor, so poor that they would never, ever, ever come back again because it's disrespectful or completely unintelligible. So what percentage of the cause problems? Harm. What percentage of the problems with regards to translation um, is the courts using archaic language and not uh, fully adopting plain language? I ask this because Washington State is considering a court rule um, that would uh, push for everything the court creates to be done in plain language. Who is the question directed to? Um, so several people, uh, including Diana originally, um, talked about the uh, problems with um, legal specific language and not using plain language. So Diana, potentially, but anyone could answer. Diana, do you want to answer? I believe she's on, she's muted. Okay, so she's on Ah, it. hi. Hey. <laughs> I've been trying to jump in here for a while. Um, oh, sorry so about that. Thank, you, thank you for No, that's quite all right. I understand. Um, so, uh, well, just if I could, I, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, I just wanted to chime in on one issue with regards to the disclaimers. I think the disclaimers are really helpful to um, for those people who are putting that content out to protect them from potential liability. Um, but they're not really helpful to the people who are reading because if you read something and you and it says, and I will say also that um, I've seen some people spend a whole lot more time getting a professional translation of their disclaimer so that they can then put up machine translation text. And I feel like that is just an unwise allocation of resources, but it really doesn't help the reader if they um, see a lovely translation of a disclaimer saying, well, this may or may not be reliable information. I mean, how are they to know what is reliable or unreliable. So I just, I feel like that's just 
not a good solution to this issue. Um, but getting back to the question of, well, is the problem really the source text? I would say yes. Um, and is Google Translate, could that work if all source te text were fabulously drafted and plain language and everything else? And I would still hesitate. I don't, I, I just feel like without knowing what the full context is and without being able to provide that machine translation um, with the full context of what this document is. I mean, if you're putting in the word exit, yeah, you're going to get the right thing, right? But if you're putting in something that actually has some legal weight to it, I, I just feel like it's very risky to rely on machine translation. Um, I'm not saying that tomorrow with the, you know, who knows, right? I mean, when I was in college, we had email for the first time. So, and Lord knows we've come a long way from there. So I have no idea what the future holds with machine translation, but I would say that right now it is an extremely risky proposition to rely on it for legally accurate translation. Do you have a question from Taylor who was wondering about using uh, Google Translate for translating legal referral information, so program description, office location, phone number, income requirements, et cetera? Is that for me? Kind um, of for any of the panelists. I mean, I, I feel like without knowing exactly what it is, I, I don't know um, what to say on that. Um, you could certainly try it and see what happens. but. Um, I think it could be, uh, you know, if we're talking about one word like telephone, you know, um, but again, I kind of um, always like to point people back to the fact that we already have lots of things developed that can be easily adapted for that. So, for example, we have a notice of lang available language access services, and as part of that notice, we have translated into several different languages professionally, um, you know, where to get help, um, who to contact, that kind of stuff, and it can all be adapted for the local setting. So, um, again, when you're talking about one word or very basic translation, Google Translate might be just fine, but why not use something that's already been developed for that purpose? Um, I, I'm going to um, share that um, Trasen has some wonderful legal icons. And I think that in a lot of ways, um, like Diana shared, a lot of those kind of um, instructions could be iconized or done more um, in a diag diagram kind of way. So I'm putting in the chat uh, to share the Trascend Legal icons because I think that with some of the LEP communities, um, that, that, may be, that may go a long way and it may minimize the need to have a words or complicated concepts. You know, if you can use an icon that denotes like a rest or something that's um, a little bit more complicated and that, that has some legal weight, like Diana says, like, can you pay? So check out the icons, because I think that those can go a long way if you're creating a content or instructions or a workflow, and uh, you could use the icons intermittently. No, that, that is a great point. I think that legal publications generally could use a lot more icons. Yeah, and they, they, they get rid of Word or it, the words will, you know, there'll be a backup for that. So I really encourage people to look at, at this library that Trasen has shared, but also there are others in the legal aid community that are doing um, good work with workflows and, um, and simplification of process, so all of these things will, will lead to better better print and better content. Any other questions? Um, if, if someone has a site that has some previously um, translated uh, items on it, what is the best way for them to go about auditing to see if those were done well? The process, like what, what you, how you would walk backwards to, to do mm -hmm. a quality review. Yep. Maria. Um, so you could ha you could have a, a certified reviewer um, review it. I think if because we're talking about legal materials, you would probably want to have a court certified uh, reviewer. Um, look at it. Uh, it each, each, for instance, uh, the 
if you go to our library and look for uh, certification mechanisms, there's a list of organizations that explain how you contact the different members, but to find someone who's course certified to look at it and say whether they're willing to certify it as correct or to make suggestions or corrections to improve the document or the entries. Uh, any more questions from the audience? This has been a, a very active question and answer session. People are very, very interested in this. Um, I think that wraps it up. We will have a blog post that pulls out some of the major points, and we will have the full video up uh, within a week on our YouTube channel, and we will send that out along with ways to uh, find or contact our speakers. Um, thank you so much for putting this on Pro Bono Net. Um, we will be having a second uh, webinar on language access that covers um, some different topics, a little bit more of, uh, on the traditional side of language access um, later on this year. Um, anything you would like to close with, uh, Jillian or Claudia? I, I want to thank our panelists um, for, for, for joining and, and working um, on on pulling this content together. I hope it's helpful to the audience and uh, that it's given you some exposure to, uh, to translation memory, which is not something we have talked a lot in the legal court nonprofit world. And uh, hopefully if, if anybody's, you know, give us the feedback in the survey, um, I am hoping that we will see more groups um, use the translation memory um, to produce content and maybe hopefully in the long term we can dream of collaboration uh, between groups that are using um, pretty much a routine language all around. So if anybody wants to think or brainstorm about that, feel free to, to reach out. But this, um, this has been very educational for me to see the back end of the translation memory and I hope everybody has enjoyed the exposure to those um, those capacities that, that are we are fairly new and we haven't used. And just a plug that some of that could also be used to translate to plain language. Just some, some plant a seed on that too. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you to all the panelists. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we, we look forward to doing much more on this topic as the uh, years go on. This is one of our most popular webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.